John chapter 8 as we make our way through the Bible, through the Gospel of John, verse by verse. If you need a Bible to follow along, you can raise your hand. One of the ushers will bring you a Bible. We're starting in verse 37. Man, chapter 8 has just been the bomb, hasn't it? I mean, just hard-hitting stuff from Jesus himself as he interacts with these religious rulers. We get tons of biblical doctrine just listening to him, right? Boy, you know, there's an old saying. I'm sure you've heard it. Blinded by the light, which most commonly refers to being blinded by success or being blinded by ambition in life. And you know, there's another saying, blinded by darkness, which can refer to being blind to sinister or evil schemes. Sometimes I think people can be blinded by both at the same time. If there's not that true light of God's goodness that lights the path of our life. And that's what we have when we follow Jesus Christ. It's a place of ultimate, eternal security that's always exactly what it looks like. The way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Yeah. Oh man, we love to follow Jesus, don't we? Because we feel so secure in that. And the world is full of all kinds of things, man. Somebody hiccups on Wall Street and you lose your 401k. What, what kind of deal is that? Man, we need to follow Jesus because he's the way. You know, we've made our way through the gospel of John chapter 8 and we've been watching as Jesus confronted the Jewish religious rulers that were threatened by his light. They were threatened by his truth and they were threatened by his way. As some of the folks there at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem finally agreed that Jesus must be from God. Nobody can do these things or say these things unless they are from God. And then you remember last study, Jesus directed them by saying, if you abide in my word, then you will be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Don't you just love that phrase, that saying, that passage? The freedom Jesus spoke of was the freedom from the sin nature that all mankind is born with. He spoke of a spiritual freedom from the power of sin, sin that brings death or eternal separation from God. And the Jews there said to him, hey, We've never been in bondage to anyone. We are Abraham's descendants, probably referring to the heritage they had through Abraham, who is called the father of the Jews. So Jesus addresses this issue now as we continue in verse 37 of John chapter 8. And he says to them, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered him and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus replied, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Let's pause here for a moment. 
it seems Jesus is always speaking about the things of the Spirit and the Jews were always focused on the material or physical things that they could see with their mind and understand with their logic. And they said, well, we're Abraham's descendants. And Jesus said, yes, you are genetically, but not spiritually. You're not his children. What does he mean? We know in Romans chapter 4, for you Bible students, boy, a lot of my Bibles, I write a lot of stuff in the margins. I put Romans 4 right here in this passage. The apostle Paul taught by the Spirit of God. He declared that Abraham is the father of all who believe in God. And later, Paul would declare in Galatians that Abraham was made righteous before God because Abraham believed God or acted in obedience through faith. That's the definition of believing, that you act in obedience through faith in this context of this relationship with God. So this is what Jesus is referring to here, that Abraham is your father if you believe in God. And the evidence of true believing is doing what Abraham did. He was obedient to God in a place of faith, even though when we study Abraham's life, we see that he failed in his performance of that faith many times. But we realize God was waiting for his faith to come to a place of completion. And I like that about God. He's not looking at our performance primarily. He's looking at where we are in our faith. So, you know, everybody's like, man, you better find another Abraham. God's like, no, wait. I think he's going to develop in his faith because he wants to follow me. So faith takes time to develop, just like it did in Abraham's life. God was looking upon his faith, not his performance. And that is one of the aspects of God's grace in our life today. Our performance, if we get into this thing about just trying to judge our performance as Christians, boy, we can get really discouraged because we're trying to follow Jesus, right? If you compare yourself to Jesus, man, you're going to fall short in every single area. So it's a place of faith, isn't it? That's what God wants us to know. We walk in God not by performance or religious duties, but by a place of faith. <clears throat> so Jesus points to this issue in this confrontation with the Jewish leaders. And it, it helps us realize that God is more concerned about the condition of our heart. That part of it's that the Bible tells us we can't really fully know. God is more concerned about our attitude in what we're going through in life. But you know, we as human parents can understand this concept as we watch our small children struggle with issues in their life. We know when they are really trying and we know when they're not, right? It's the same type of issue here. God knows us. He knows everything about us. So we can just simply say, okay, God, I need you to reveal it to me. Reveal what's going on in my heart. It's interesting when God does that, it just really lights you up. You're thinking, not only does God know me, but he likes me. He's trying to develop my life like he did Abraham and keep me away from certain things like what we see with the Pharisees here, the religious rulers. <clears throat> Abraham loved God. The Bible tells us that. Abraham is described in the New Testament as a friend of God. Don't you like that? Abraham wanted to please God and was finally able to see this promise of God in his life through the miraculous birth of a child named Isaac. 
Isaac that fulfilled the promise of God to his life, which can be paralleled to what happens to us in God's Son. This miraculous birth that happens to us as Jesus is birthed in us through believing in him. Do you see that beautiful parallel there? there? And the same concepts develop from it. You know, these Jewish leaders, they secretly sought to kill Jesus. We already know that. Jesus knew it, and he openly confronted them several times over it. Did Jesus do that just because he was mean and nasty? Because he wanted to get in somebody's face? Or did he do it because he was trying to help them understand what was inside of them? They needed to know that murder was in their hearts. And they couldn't rationalize it away because of whatever they thought. And that's what God does in us as well. He shows us what's inside of us so that we can say, oh, God, change my heart. And I know without a doubt God is the only one that can change our hearts. Man, that is a heavy de deal, isn't it? That God could change my heart from somebody that just really loves themselves and does whatever they want, and yet I feel empty and I cry out to God, would you change my heart, God? And then watch him do that as I simply yield to what he's shown me in the word. I'm not working for it. I'm just yielding to it. Does that make sense? Have you ever had to yield to something? Of course you do every time you drive your car, right? Signs says, stop, you better yield. Or Officer Barr. No, he's retired now. <laughs> no more breaks with Officer Barr. Wow, we're going to have to really watch our driving. Less retired, so we're on our own. We better re obey the laws of the land. Notice, Jesus confronts this evil in them. He tells them, Abraham would have never sought to kill a man like me. And as these leaders had already admitted that Jesus was from God, but they were blinded by something, weren't they? Were they blinded by ambition? Were they blinded by their success or their, their beauty? Or was it a dark evil? Maybe even both. I, I think it was both. Because they had all the beauty of that heritage of Abraham. Man, and they, they, when they're dressed in all of their priestly um, regalia, they're just beautiful to look at. And they knew that too. And it was blinding them, just like it did the devil. Jesus repeated in verse 41, you do the works of your father. Of course, they lashed back and said, we weren't born of fornication. Ooh, we have one father, God. And they're implying that Jesus was born of an illegitimate birth. One historian, Flavius Josephus, said that the rumor at that time was the father of Jesus was a Roman soldier. As Jesus claimed, his human birth was miraculous, divine. It was the Holy Spirit in his mother Mary, although you can only imagine how difficult it would to uh, believe that Jesus was born um, by the Holy Spirit, bringing this miraculous conception to Mary. But that's exactly what happened. How do we know that it's the truth? Because it lines up with the prophecies. The same prophecies these religious rulers would have memorized. They knew the books in their heart. They're seeing the fulfillment of it, yet they're blinded by satanic power from the light and the darkness in life in their humanity. I often would think, man, if these guys could be blinded, what chance do I have? I'm the little country preacher. I don't have no robe, man. <laughs> but I have the Word of God, don't I? And if I will just yield to what it's showing me, I won't be blinded. And even the little country preacher can be okay if he has his Bible. And so can you. 
But you have to yield to it. You have to realize it's the Word of God and it has authority in your life. If not, you'll be just as blind as they were. That's some pretty serious stuff. Thinking about the prophecies of Jesus as he told them exactly who he was and how he appeared. We remember the prophecy from Isaiah 7, 14, right? That the, fir the virgin shall be with child. We remember that, don't we? I remember Malachi chapter 5 that the Messiah would not only be humanly born, but would be eternal. Man, that's what it says in Malachi 5. The Gospels, John chapter 1, tells us he was with God in the beginning. Paul from Colossians 3.17 says that Jesus always existed. So when we see Jesus making these remarks, we have a solid foundation for that truth simply by reading the Bible. Don't have to get anybody's book. Don't have to, to do anything special. I recommend going to Bible studies to explain this stuff to you because that's how we all learn. So Jesus tells them, if God were your father, then you would love me because I came from God in heaven. Jesus, again, speaking of a spiritual heritage, which reminds us of the Old Testament. We see several illustrations of this, starting with Abraham. Remember, he had two kids. The first one's name was Ishmael, but it wasn't the promised child. They did that through a surrogate mother. God said, you shall have a child with Sarai, Sarai, your wife. So it, they wait. It doesn't happen. They circumvent the process and say, there's the child. And God says, uh-uh. That's not a child of faith. They wait until it's physically impossible for them to have children. She is pregnant and has Isaac. He becomes the child of promise. So you have a spiritual child and you have the child of the flesh. In Isaac's life, he had two kids, remember? Two boys. The first one named Esau. And they were actually twins, but Esau would come out of the womb first. But then there's a hand on his heel. And they name him Jacob. Because that's what that means, heel catcher. Esau was a man of the field. He liked to hunt and fish, man. Hunting and fishing, that's my life. I'm a hairy old man. And if you don't like it, that's too bad. But he didn't care about his heritage. His heritage with God. Jacob was a man that cared about the heritage of God. Spiritual and physical. Esau even sold his birthright because he was hungry. Been out hunting and didn't get anything like me. You know, I go fishing and I don't catch anything. But I don't go hungry. So we see these examples of both the spirit and the flesh. And that's what Jesus is presenting to them. That you can be descendants of Abraham, but not children of God. How much more for us that we can live in a mentality that we were born in America, Christian nation until recently, I guess. Or we came from a Christian family, right? So we must be Christian. Or even that we go to church and we agree with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God, told us in the New Testament to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith or not. Man, that kind of bugs me. Yes, we must judge our own faith, whether it is genuine or not, whether it is spiritual or physical. And the true test is always shown us in what we choose in life. I've always told people, if you can continue in willful, rebellious sin to God after you say you've become a Christian, then you're not a Christian. We all fail in the performance of our Christ-likeness, and we all struggle with sinful things in life. But the key is, are you struggling, are you battling, or are you giving into it and saying, I'm a Christian, but no one's perfect. You know, no one can say they're perfect. I want you to know that's a demonic lie. It's a philosophy that comes from the pit of hell and it will deceive you. And that's what we're going to talk about 
this morning. The things that can deceive us. So Jesus then says to them in verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of the Father. You are of your Father, the devil. And the desires of the, your Father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resource. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you, if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Wow. Jesus, tell us how you really feel about this. <laughs> I mean, isn't that a little politically incorrect? Or it, wouldn't that be considered hate language today? To tell somebody, you are of the Father, the devil, because you do what he does. That's the message I'm taking to Washington. <laughs> Now you know why they don't let me in the Capitol building. <laughs> That's the message that we would have to speak, isn't it? You're doing what your father does. He was a liar from the beginning and a murderer. You stand by while millions are murdered because you want to be politically correct. You're not of God. I don't care how long you pray. It's not a political correct message, is it? And we need to get over that in life. Many times we have to love people enough to be truthful with them. Jesus is God. He is love. And he's absolutely truthful. And the way I read this this morning, I believe is the very tone that Jesus gave. That he's not mad. He's not yelling at him. He's very calm. I picture him even folding his hands and saying, the reason you can't listen to me is because you're of the father, you're, de you're of your father, the devil. And the, they're just looking at him like, did he just really say that? <laughs> it's so interesting, it's so heavy. They cannot understand what Jesus is saying because they are not able to listen to his word because they're being influenced by something else, right? It's the devil, Jesus says. In other words, they are heavily influenced by demonic deception, even to the point of wanting to kill Jesus because he spoke the truth to them. That's the issue. Jesus makes it clear. Notice, <clears throat> Jesus comments that the devil, speaking of Satan, who we know from other places in the Bible is an angel, which was called Lucifer, son of the morning. And this angel was created by God with great beauty and splendor. And because of that beauty, he was lifted up in personal pride that conflicted with the nature of God. God confronted him with it and he led a rebellion in heaven and deceived a third of the angels to follow him and said, I will be God. And everybody went, oh no. Why did God do that? Well, God didn't do it. Well, why did God allow it? He knew this would take place. And in every place of rebellion, God shares the truth with, with us and says, turn around. I created you in your beauty to glorify me, that you would be a reflection of me because of my great love for you. Where's your love for me? And this is the message that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees in all their beauty. I don't know if you've ever seen a rabbi or a student rabbi. I was in Israel in 09. They were taking pictures of a young rabbi, all of his, his priestly garments. And man, he was beautiful. I was just awestruck at the beauty of this human being standing by the Sea of Galilee. He had a shofar by him. There was a photographer, and I was mesmerized. And I'm thinking, is that the same beauty that's blinded them? Because they know they're the people of God, right? 
They understand the heritage of Abraham, but does that happen to Christians as well? Jesus commenting about the devil tells us who the devil is and what he does, and we realize God didn't destroy Satan. He didn't destroy the angels in the rebellion. God allows them to exist, but we learn from Job chapter 1, God will restrain what they can do in believers' lives. In other words, God will allow the enemy to attack believers, but it will simply be because of what God wants to do. Remember, Jesus said to Peter, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat. And when you are restored, strengthen your brethren. I have prayed for you. He's implying that he's going to let the devil do that. And I think God lets the devil sift us too. I think I've been going through a lot of sifting. I'm just sifted out, man. I'm sifted to a place of just walking in God's grace because that's all I have left. How about you? Is that where you are in your walk with God? Just walking in His grace? Speaking of the truth in love with your hands folded because you understand people are deceived? It's interesting. In Satan's rebellion to God, murder or the capacity to destroy life filled Satan's heart. He began to influence mankind in the Garden of Eden because God created man in the same way as angels with a free will. And God allowed this temptation and men fell into a place of sin because of their pride. The same pride that we deal with today. I'm not talking about the pride that you shine your car and you go, oh, that's beautiful. I take pride in that. I'm talking about this kind of pride. What would you say? What? You want some of this? Huh? You want some? That's the kind of pride I'm talking about. You see the difference? Because sometimes people today say, well, God wants us to, be, to have pride in what we do. I say, well, there's different kinds of pride. I'm talking about the all up in yourself pride. <laughs> so let's get that straight with these things as Satan murders mankind in the garden in a spiritual way, right? He would cause death in their life. He murdered them. Even though it took Adam 900 and something years to die. He died that day spiritually and he knew it. We see throughout time how Satan has brought this kind of murderous influence. Remember a guy named Cain in the beginning of the Bible. A son of Adam. His first son. He was murdered by, or we, uh, uh, excuse me, a man named Abel who was murdered by his brother Cain. Influenced by Satan. We see that from the context that sin, death, sits at your door. And you must master it. If not, you will become a murderer. Satan has influenced mankind from the spirit realm in what we call demonic influence that can only be affected or triggered by man's pride, like Satan. So when Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. He is saying you are influenced by what Satan wants. It's keeping you from being influenced by what God wants. It's pretty simple logic, isn't it? And in that culture, children often followed the footsteps of the father, either good or evil. The same can be affected today, but it's more of a statement of influence than principle. Jesus then tells us Satan is the father of lies in verse 44, which means Satan is the originator, the creator of lies in God's creation, which also influences people heavily today in this life. All through that fallen nature, through pride, and for us, when we turn to a lie to protect us from usually some fear or some issue in life, we are turning to what Satan offers in the way of protection. Do we see instances of that 
in people's lives? Well, I was afraid. That's why I lied. It's very common for people, or those guys really messed me around. I'm just going to call them and tell them this. We had a lady at the airline one time tell us, just tell them you have critical medications in your luggage. They'll find it r real quick. I go, well, we don't. I don't have any critical medication. My only critical medication is my Bible, and I have it in my carry-on. <laughs> the world is, is just uses lies, right? It's because it's influenced by Satan. That's where lies have come from. Now, we see instances in the Bible where people lie to protect others in a place of virtue, don't we? Remember Rahab lying about the Israeli spies? Yeah, you know, they left, but she had hidden them. We see people lying to protect others in a way of virtue, but I'm talking about lying to protect ourselves because we won't trust God. This is something the devil uses against us. Oh, I can't really lie about this, but if I tell the truth, these people are really going to get hurt. So God, show me what to do. I lied one time at work. I told my su supervisor, this, this employee had nothing to do with this. This was all on me. Because the guy was afraid. He was like, oh, what do we do? What do, we do? I, he goes, we can't tell the truth. If we tell the truth, we're going to lose our jobs. And, you know, I got a $1,500 a month house payment, and child support, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hey, uh, calm down. I'll take the responsibility. I know you're afraid. But I'm going to honor God in this. And he was a, a Christian, said he was a believer. I'm going to honor God in this. I, you know, I know it's not going to be good, but we have to honor God when we're faced with these things. You know, it turned out so awesome. I got a letter from my supervisor apologizing to me for not filing an investigation on it. I don't know what happened. A month went by, and I'm so sorry. I bet you were worried sick. I was like, well, a little... <laughs> you know. But my wife and I prayed. We trusted God that if I get six months off without pay, I'm going fishing, baby. Because no, I didn't have a big house payment. <laughs> so we can trust God in these places where we are tempted to lie. We must be very careful of this. I believe if we continue to turn to what Satan has to offer in the way of protection through lies in our human logic and will through our rationalizations, then God will eventually turn us over to that way. And that's in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and verse 28. That if we insist on some demonic way of life, God will eventually say, okay. And if you've done that in life, and you're living through that right now, I want you to also know the, the sweetest word in all of the Bible, except for the, the name of Jesus, and it's repentance. You can begin to seek God for repentance. That God, I want to change the way I do things. That's what the word means. God, I want to change the way I do things. It was my fault. It wasn't my parents' fault or the pressure of life. It was my fault. God, I'm seeking you that you would grant me repentance and restore unto me that place that I had with you. Do you know it's God's desire to do that? He's wanting to do that, but he has to wait for us to say, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want this program in my life. I no longer want to pay Luigi for protection. You know, I want to turn to my father to watch over my life. So that means I'm going to do what my father wants me to do, right? This is what Jesus is bringing out in this section. So the question comes up, can people today in this modern age with all of our science and understanding be influenced by Satan? Hmm. Absolutely. We see it all around us, don't we? In my opinion, it's mostly masked or hidden within the, the scopes of social disorders, behavioral disorders, even the mental illness category, or even radical religious processes. That's what the world says it is. I'm going, no, that's demonic influence. That's what they call evil. 
and it's the source of evil is the opposite of God. That's what our world and our leaders in our country today are afraid to deal with because then they'll have to say, well, if there's evil, then there must be a God. You guys have heard me say evil is simply the absence of good. Just as cold is the absence of heat or dark the absence of light. The same way spiritually, evil is the absence of God in every single category. Where you see evil, it's the absence of God, which equals what? Demonic influence. There are many cases of mental health issues that are caused by clinical medical things that can be shown to us through clinical medical science, like a, like a kidney problem or a liver problem. Clinical medical science shows us those things, and don't be deceived by anything else. That if there's a brain disorder or an imbalance, clinical medical science will point it out. Not some therapist somewhere say, well, you're just bipolar. And I'm like, we're all bipolar. Have you looked lately? <laughs> Have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> or are you drinking the same kind of Kool-Aid here? We got to address these things from a loving place, from a truthful place, from a place that the Bible shows us. This is interesting. From this study that I was looking at, from this research... The, the, some of the things we see in our society today have all the earmarks or evidences of demonic activity, which I've verified with Christian law officers over the years. You know, we have a law officer here in our board, and I'm like, you know, Les, in these cases, do you see these same types of evidence? He goes, absolutely. I said, what does that tell you as a Christian law officer? It's demonic influence. I said, are you able to share that with people? I said, not professionally, but I often point people to a place you need the light of God in your life. This is dark, isn't it? Isn't this yucky? Look at it. It's so yucky. All of the, the sexual stuff going all the way into pedophilia and bestiality, all of it, same sex things, are simply people turning away from God. And in that place we see all of those demonic earmarks in just clinical research. So can Christians be influenced by satanic or demonic philosophy and lies in our culture today? Another question. Can Christians be influenced by demonic lies and philosophy in our culture today? From my opinion, the, the answer is absolutely. Do we see it in the Bible? We do. The Apostle Paul speaks of demonic influence among believers and warning us that we must take up the whole armor of God to stand against it. He's speaking that to, speaking that to Christians, right? So we can be influenced by demonic things and we need armor on to withstand it. The Apostle Paul tells us a lot about these things, telling us, to not have anything to do with the unfruitful deeds of darkness or demonic influence. Paul says God won't let us be tempted by those things beyond our ability to, to resist, but he'll give us a way of escape, and that's always by yielding to God. We know what God wants. And Jesus is saying this to the, to the religious rulers. You know what God wants. You saw what Abraham did. Come on, come out of it. Come to the light. It's so amazing that uh, Jesus prays for believers in John se chapter 17 that we, they would be kept from, from evil by the power of God. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus leads us to ask God to deliver us from evil so Christians can absolutely be influenced by satanic, demonic lies and philosophies. And even practically speaking, I have felt the influence of demonic influence many times in my life to follow what, what Satan wanted, what this devil wanted, instead of what I knew God was wanting. 
And I had to make that choice to yield to God. It's that old free will thing again. I hate that. And if we don't choose to yield to God's word in principle, then we will be susceptible to being deceived and taken captive by Satan to do his will, rocking Christians to sleep, slowly but surely, warming up the water so you're nice and comfortable, and you don't have any desire to understand what's really taking place in this world. Boy, we see so many people that I know are believers being deceived into hurting someone else, hurting others, hurting themselves, all through this thing called sin. It's the sin of the flesh. It's always encapsulated through human pride. The Apostle Paul instructs Pastor Timothy of folks being taken captive by Satan to do his will in the context of church ministry. And I can verify so many times people that I know are believers have attacked this church. They've attacked me personally over the years. And if that's not being influenced by Satan, I don't know what is. And it was a crack up one time. This person told me I needed to be attacked. And because I was just so out of line with God and, and so unlike Jesus and all this stuff. And I go, well, well, who made you the accuser of the brethren? <laughs> you know, did God tell you in his word, I want you to go and find these pastors and attack them? Who is the accuser of the brethren? It's Satan. So are you accusing or are you loving? I get corrected often by people that love me. And they come up and be like, dude, man, when you say that, it's really going to sound bad. Or, dude, your zipper's down, dude. Come on. You know? <laughs> that happened recently. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, thank you for loving me so much. You know, I'm not like, what? How dare you say that to me? <laughs> I'm like, thank you. <laughs> because it's love. That's what love does, isn't it? <clears throat> the Bible says to admonish one another in the spirit of love, not to tear down, but to build up that it would impart grace to the hearers. And if we're walking in love, we can do that. But we got to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. I had a youth pastor tell me what, that one time, and I just loved it. It doesn't sound very good coming from me, but... <laughs> we got to check ourselves that we are walking in love, and we're not there to tear somebody down. And if we don't think we can do that, we can pray and say, God, I want to pray for Pastor Joe that you'd help him to see these things. I know that he wants to serve you. He admits he's a ding-dong. Help him all that you can. Give him a, a double dose of the Holy Spirit. That's how we should deal with those kind of things. <clears throat> I think about the situation Jesus was in. These were the religious rulers he was talking to. They were the people of God, and they were so deceived by Satan that they would seek to put to death the king of glory. Man, that's an eye-opener for me. And Jesus sums it up. If you hear or abide in God's word, then you are of God. If you don't, you're not. And you won't be able to follow God unless you abide in his word. Our only security, as I said earlier is the word of God in our simple little lives, right? There's so many powers that are at work that even if you could understand them, you wouldn't want to. You'd think, why was I wanting to understand all that stuff? How come I just didn't stay with my Bible in my backyard? Because this is serious stuff. Serious enough to cause them to reject the King of glory. And we see it right before our eyes. We need the word of God to protect us, simple little people, from this demonic influence, these philosophical lies of the evil one. And if we'll simply abide in God's word and walk in it, we will always walk in the life and we will be walking in love. I wanted to point out just a few philosophical satanic lies in our culture today that are embraced by over half, 54% of people that claim to be Christians in a study that was done last year. The lie that same-sex marriage 
is accepted by God. 54% of Christians says, oh yes, God accepts same-sex marriage. Or that living together outside of marriage is okay with God. 54% marked on the form, the survey, it was okay with God. Because they love each other. The lie that macroevolutionary theory, which is also called Darwinism, that is linked to an old earth concept, that the earth is billions of billions of years old to allow for this macroevolution to take place. It's a flat out lie. Nothing in modern clinical science, empirical science, can point to this. And of course, their argument is, well, you can't prove that God is real. I'm like, I'm not trying to prove to you that God is real. I'm trying to show you that science shows us the world can't be billions of years old. You deal with God. You know, I'm just trying to get you to, to understand the truth. There's a lie that abortion on demand is a person's choice in life. <laughs> Certainly not the choice of the unborn human child. The lie that the American dream leads to happiness, fulfillment, and satisfaction. Be careful of this one. Two Republican candidates that claim to be Christians in the debate said, and we need to bring back the American dream that every human can have American, every American can have an American dream, a chicken in a pot, or what you know. You've heard that spiel before, right? Happiness does not come from the American dream. In fact, the baby boomer generation was enslaved in materialism to buy things they would never own. That's slavery. And when you hear this American dream thing, it's always in the context of you'll be happy. The Bible says only a close walk with Jesus can bring happiness. You see those satanic philosophical lies? That's only four of them. This culture is full of them and they're exposed one by one as we simply study God's word. So listen to what the religious rulers say to Jesus in response to Jesus being very clear about what is influencing them in life. Verse 48, Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? That was the, the biggest smackdown they could ever bring to anyone in the Jewish culture. Samaritans <coughs> excuse me, were considered heretics. They were considered um, dirty dogs that were going to hell. And to tell a rabbi that he had a demon was saying, you're demon-possessed. So Jesus answers verse 49 and says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me and I do not seek my own glory there is one who seeks and judges most assuredly I say to you if anyone keeps my word he shall never see death then the Jews said to him now we know you have a demon Abraham is dead and the prophets and you say if anyone keeps my word he shall never taste death are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets that are dead We'd all say, uh-huh. Whom do you make yourself out to be? And he's already told them numerous times. They respond with a personal attack against Jesus. They responded with a personal attack earlier, and now they actually um, accelerate this attack, which, number one, is very unprofessional. And it's very revealing and helpful to us. In what way? As we confront demonic influence in those around us from a place of godly love, like Jesus, simply speaking the truth in love, then those folks around us, when they respond with a personal attack, or we call it getting in the flesh, you know what I mean? They're not in the Spirit of God. It's revealing they're not in the will of God. They're not walking with God. The same is true for us. We can respond in the flesh over things too, can't we? And we need to stop and say, I'm in the flesh? No, duh. I need to go and pray and be with Jesus. Repent from this. Get my heart right with Him because we have emotions. 
Sometimes we're going to get in the flesh. The Bible tells us that, that to be angry yet do not sin. So when I'm in the flesh and I'm angry, I can stop and ask Jesus to cleanse my heart. This is what confirms where we're coming from. If you desire to honor the Father like Jesus, you'll stop. You'll repent. Or, if you're walking with Jesus, speaking truth and love, you will be attacked in the same way that Jesus was. You need to get used to that. But use it as a confirmation that you are in the truth, just like Jesus. And being careful that we're not seeking our own will, our own desire, our own glory, Jesus said, or our own honor, or I added this one, our own justification. We oftentimes are trying to justify our actions to others, and it's of the flesh. These conflicts are part of life. It was happening to Jesus to teach us. Jesus stated in verse 50 that I'm not here about what I want. It's about what the Father wants. Simply trying to accomplish what I know that God wants, and he wants to save you. He wants you to come to the truth, and that's why I'm here. This is interesting. Jesus abruptly states in verse 51. Do you notice this context? You're like, did the translators miss something here? Out of the clear blue, and he does this frequently in, in the Gospel of John. He abruptly, in the middle of this confrontation, states in verse 51 that if anyone keeps his word or declaration, they will never see death. And again, Jesus is speaking of the spiritual context that death is eternal separation from God. Life is eternal life with God. But notice the Jews respond, you're out of your mind. You're, you're a Samaritan and you have a demon. Abraham's dead. The prophets are dead. But you said, if one keeps your word, they shall never taste death. Again, they're seeing everything from the physical aspect and not the spiritual. Abraham did die physically, but we'll see him in heaven. The prophets that honored God died physically. Thank God we'd see Isaiah walking around. He'd scare us to death. <laughs> they live spiritually, along with all who keep the word of Jesus that he declared from the beginning. If you believe in me, Speaking of the work of the Messiah, he will never die. Abraham believed in the Messiah. He wrote of the city that would come. He wrote of the deliverer. So did all the prophets. They spoke and foretold of the Messiah coming. These rulers knew about the Messiah, but were blinded by satanic influence to the fact that Jesus was there standing right in front of them. And that's how bad and serious that blindness can be in people who say they believe in God. Does that make you shudder? It should. It should make you realize that we need the Word of God in our lives on a regular basis. If not, we can be deceived. So Jesus ends here in verse 54 and and answers, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you do not know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Oh, there he goes again. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, or before Abraham existed, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now notice how Jesus equates knowing God with keeping God's word. The two go together. Just as John would later teach in his epistles, if you say you believe in God and don't keep his word, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. It's simple logic, isn't it? 
That's not hate language. It's the truth. And we need to tell people that truth because 80% of people in America say they're Christians. I don't see that in the, the society we live in. Somebody not telling the truth around here. And we need to be the ones that are telling some truth, don't we? If you say that he is the Lord, then you must follow his word. If you don't, you're a liar. That's when they picked up stones to kill Jesus. It proves to us Jesus told them again that he was God. And that's why they were going to try to kill him. He says, before Abraham existed, I am. It's again the same designation we looked at last study that only God can use. If you missed the study, it's on the website. You can download it or um, request a CD. Notice verse 56. Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see his day and he saw it and was glad. Even though Abraham lived about 2,000 years before Jesus. So when did all that happen? Do we see that in the book of Genesis? We really don't. Jesus just says it happened. Some believe it was during the time that God called Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice in this place called Mount Moriah. Do you guys know where that is? It's at the very top of the hill in Jerusalem. The same place that Jesus was crucified called Golgotha. It's the word for Calvary. So we could be the skull church, right? You know, it's a place of the skull. And be like, we should get some black jackets or something. And, and earrings and stuff like that. <laughs> it's the same place 2,000 years ago. The Son of God would be sacrificed. We know that God was testing Abraham in the final way to offer up his only son, his beloved son. And as Isaac raised the knife, I mean, Abraham raised the knife, God said, stop. Now I know you will withhold nothing from me. And he lifted his eyes and there was a, a ram, a goat stuck in a bush. And he said, there's the sacrifice. Abraham even told Isaac on the way there, Abra you know, Isaac's like, we got the wood and we got the stuff. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. You remember that? So we see the fulfillment of all of these things. That could have been when Abraham saw his day and rejoiced. That he had this vision of God offering up his only begotten son. For the love that he had for people. It's very possible. God does stuff like that. And also, Abraham had had two experiences with what I believe is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. One in Genesis 14, for you Bible students, another one in Genesis 18. Genesis 14, we see Jesus as the priest, Melchizedek. I believe that's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Also, Genesis 18, Jesus comes with two angels to Abraham and tells him what he's going to do in Sodom. And he tells, he calls himself the Lord there. I'm firmly convinced that these were pre-incarnate appearances of Christ called Christophanies, which is very important to our doctrine, to our <clears throat> theology. Jesus can come and show himself to you today, can't he? We know the Apostle Paul told us that Jesus appeared to him several times. As, Jesus, as Paul learned about the gospel. You know, I want you to know one thing. Jesus chooses to reveal himself through his word mostly to the church today because he doesn't want it based on some supernatural spiritual experience from a vision you have, but he wants you in the word. And as you read the Bible, you've heard me say this lately, the Bible will read you. And that's when you know Jesus is real. That's when you know he's appearing to you. And that's when you become grounded in the word of God so you're not deceived like the Pharisees. Get it? And you're established in this place because it brings you back to that place with Jesus daily. Do we want to experience Jesus in a real way? I'm like, yeah. I'm afraid that you'll send me to Africa. 
It's like, well, what if I send you to Hawaii? He said, I don't like Hawaii either. The waves are too big. But where do you want to go? I just want to stay here. And I want to serve you here, God. He goes, okay, do it. I want to ask the musicians to come as we close. Jesus will give you what it is you really want. That's what he does. He wants to fill your life to overflowing with the reality of who he is. He'll only take you as far as you'll allow him to take you. Because he loves you so much. He doesn't want to stress you out. And when you feel stressed out, it's the devil. He's trying to put pressure on you to make you think, well, I do all this stuff. And Jesus says, hey, whatever happened to grace? Whatever happened to my love just flowing in your life? And now the love of God is what's manipulating you. Instead of all these religious pressures, it's time to take a breath and listen to Jesus. He will speak to you through the word. He will speak to you through your mind and your heart. And it'll always line up with his word. Always. Even in the tough things. And there are some. Let's all stand together this morning. If you've never received the truth of the gospel that we're sinful and cannot save ourselves and you would like to believe in Jesus who promises to save us, then ask him in your heart this morning and let us pray with you today after the service. We'll be here to pray with you if you're going through a tough time. That's what the body of Christ does, to pray with one another. So as you leave this morning and you see somebody, the Lord lays on your heart to pray with somebody, do that. Say, can I pray for you this morning that God would touch your life in a powerful way? We all need that. So let's bring him our hearts as we close and bless his holy name. Your name is a strong mighty town. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nations sing loud. Father, we thank you and rejoice this morning that you have loved us enough to give us what we need to be secure in the midst of tons of demonic deception. We can rejoice and be thankful and absolutely solid in this life and walk through it like Jesus, declaring the truth in love because of your great love for people. We rejoice in that today that you make life exciting for us because of the gospel. And God's people said, Amen. Let's give him praise this morning. We praise you, oh God. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day in the Lord. <laughs>